welcome to the Data Democracy. Presented by renowned O'Reilly author Ole Olsen Banyu. And powered by Xenia. Make your data accessible and discoverable by anyone, anywhere, at any time. Hi, everybody. You're listening to The Data Democracy, and I'm your host, Ole Olesen Benjeu, Chief Evangelist in Cinea and the author of the Enterprise Data Catalog, published by O'Reilly. In this podcast, we explore what a data democracy is with knowledge guests. Today's guest is Luc Legadeur. Luc is the CEO of Cinea, and this episode is the season one finale. We took a moment to reflect on the insights shared by the guests on The Data Democracy. And so I let Luke interview me about the guests that have been on the Data Democracy in this first season. But I also wanted to ask Luke two things. First, how to become a successful entrepreneur in tech. And second, I wanted to see if I could get Luke into revealing just a bit of the roadmap of Senea. One more thing for the listeners. Luke has a really impressive track record, having worked for Microsoft and personally admit Bill Gates, then for Oracle, and finally as an entrepreneur with multiple companies, each with failures and successes alike. So stay tuned for the last part of the conversation where we deep dive into Luke's past and also see and also how he sees the future of Cinea. I can already tell you that it looks very promising. Okay, so here are my takeaways from my conversation with Luke. First, a data leader takeaway. In this episode finale, I want to highlight Luke's qualities as a CEO and entrepreneur. CEOs need to make many decisions, move fast and don't look back. But a CEO also needs to spend substantial time with the employees and the customers and not lock themselves into an ivory tower. Luke has been very successful as an entrepreneur and he wants to share his companies and promote people creating a real positive vibe within his companies. And I suggest you listen to that advice very carefully. Second, a data democracy takeaway. To balance a data democracy, you need to understand the newest architectural patterns, balance legacy and future, reflect on your methodology and privacy, and also fight for the innovative tech solutions created in your part of the world. I think tech hubs should be all over the planet. And so this is a resume of all the conversations that I had on the podcast. So I really invite you to both listen to this episode finale resume, but also go back and listen to the episodes that you haven't catched yet. And okay, third, personal take takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, to all of my guests that took the time to sit down and talk to me. I am so thankful. Also, I uh, promise to you, listeners, that we have many really, really interesting guests lined up for the next seat. And so I think this is enough of me talking. Let's hear what Luke wants to ask me and then later what he has to say. Hi, Luke. Hi, Ole. How are you doing? I'm fine. What about you? Pretty good. Nice to be here. First time you interview me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being on, Luke. Thank you for taking the time. So, uh, first of all, uh, I know you had some questions. You're curious about uh, the podcast. So, um, let's jump right in. What, what, are, what are your questions uh, to the podcast for the first season? Well, first of all, congratulations. The, uh, your, your, your guests were really, really very interesting people. Yeah, I have four questions. The first one is about data mesh, lineage, and AI. What did you learn from those talks with those people? Yeah, yeah, we had both Samia, Irina, and Hala discussing yeah. these topics uh, on the on the podcast uh, in this first uh, season. I was quite surprised to interview Samia. She was really much more of a data mesh practitioner than I would have thought. I mean, I I knew she was a thought leader in the space, having worked closely with Jamal Dagani herself, but but she was also a a practitioner having implemented data mesh in in the pharmaceutical industry, and I was quite struck by her experience. And it was just a really cool conversation. And we also agreed that 
uh, specifically for the pharma sector, it's really nice to rely on process maps. And so, um, and so moving on uh, in terms of what Irina had to say on data lineage, Irina Steinbeck, she has written this wonderful book on, um, on data lineage, really uh, pinpointing that data lineage is not one thing, but a multitude of things. I think in, 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 in the perspective of a data democracy, that is a really nice perspective, right? You can, you can think of data lineage as something very high level for strategic uh, leaders, C-level, but you can yeah. also think of it as something very, very nitty gritty for data practitioners, data architects. So super cool insight to get that understanding of the various layers and use cases of lineage. Yeah, final... yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. High level, high level to really technical layer. Huh? Exactly, exactly. And then we have um, Hala. Uh, I discussed uh, AI with, uh, with Hala. Also, some really, really great perspectives. Uh, she's written this enormous book on AI and how we should think of, uh, of AI as something that enable a lot of capabilities in society. Uh, so more than a book about math, it's a book about how to understand the societal change that AI is, has created and, and will continuously create. So, so that was really cool. Okay, okay. And uh, what about Jenny, Malcolm, and Ronald about uh, legacy, uh, about future and language? What did you learn from them? Yes, yes, I had, I had some great conversations also with them. Jenny was the first guest on, um, on the Data Democracy podcast, and she yeah. really had those wonderful perspectives on balancing new tech and legacy, not only hating your legacy technology, but also acknowledging the role it has played, the, the, the value proposition that it, it has had over, the, over time, and how to move gently away from legacy towards a new IT landscape. That was a really interesting conversation. It's very, very difficult to do that. Um, and Malcolm uh, also touched on, on legacy, but from a different angle, right? That we, we tend to, in IT and tech, we, we, we tend to forget the past, which causes a lot of problems because we don't know the past. That is really something that makes us repeat just like the saying goes, right? It makes us repeat the same errors again and again because we aren't learning anything from COBOL and mainframe management uh, because sure. we, for, we forget all that, right? We tend to invent, reinvent the wheel without learning from the past. Huh? Exactly, exactly. Um, and so Ronald has a very deep understanding of language and, and what it means. He's kind of, as I, as I saw the... This, the sequence of conversations, he kind of provided some, some very useful answers in how to not forget the past in terms of understanding that data is actually a result of a, of a linguistic exercise that at some point was translated into IT that created data. And so he has written uh, this wonderful book that calculates backwards, trying to find out, okay, what was the root of all this data? What, what did we intend with that? Extracting those and exposing those uh, layers of language is something that we can use to, to handle IT migration and stuff like that. Hmm, yeah, yeah, very, yeah, very inspiring people. And then you switch to methodology with, with three guests that had really something to share about that. What, what yes, could be your takeaways or... Your highlights on those series yeah apologies for for, for interrupting I, I just got exciting uh, it's excited yeah yeah you're right look um for Sune, he um he had some points about data management not matching uh the safe agile manifesto so uh, when you're working with data management tasks uh, and handling data and information needs they don't blend very well those needs with the uh, safe agile, meaning that you want to. So, so let's zoom out a little bit and look at this in a data democracy context. Um, if we are to handle the data and information needs from the business, it's relatively difficult to do that if we implement a paradigm that is too strict uh, towards only one methodology, such as safe agile. 
to be a little um, direct, you can say that safe agile contains some undemocratic elements uh, in, in the way it's practiced. Then we had uh, Anna and uh, and and Seda. Let me start with Seda. Seda had some some really interesting uh, perspectives on how to understand the business uh, language and how to translate that while implementing data catalogs. She had this wonderful example of meaningless data pipelines that uh, that were functioning perfectly. So data pipelines that, from an engineering point of view, was perfectly uh, well functioning, but that just had meaningless data running through it because no one had understood uh, the business requirements and the business language well enough. And that is that is unfortunately often the case for, for data in general. And then uh, we ha- I had Anna Skulikari on. Uh, she is the author of Learning JIT. And she has invented this methodology of, of learning JIT that has really, uh, yeah, I dare say it's taken the world by storm. Yet again, an expression of data democracy that she has written a book that is super simple to understand using colors and diagrams in a way that makes readers get at ease with uh, JIT relatively fast and uh, thereby increasing the speed of which they can excel with this technology. And that is really a core pillar of, of the data democracy, right? So, so that, yeah. was, uh, that was all the points on, uh, on methodology. And finally, the fourth question about privacy tech in Brazil and in Europe, uh, where Catherine, Gabs, Ivo and Charlotte share their insights. What were they? I think it's interesting to have a ge- geographical perspective on these uh, elements also. Uh, I, I was quite struck uh, when I talked to Gabs that the tech scene is, in Brazil is, is really booming. One of the things that, uh, that he mentioned uh, as, as a sort of a special case, I guess, for Brazil, well, not only for Brazil, but, but it's not a European perspective anymore, uh, is that in Brazil, there are not that many English-speaking uh, tech professionals, meaning that it's a relatively isolated community. But it's a very, very tech-savvy community. They are really, really great at tech. And I think we will see more South American uh, tech companies and uh, authors uh, in in the years to come. It's kind of the same conversation I had with Charlotte, uh, except that of course, in Europe, it's it's becoming more and more common to that everyone everyone can speak a bit of of English, right? Which is not yet the case in Brazil. But I was very happy to learn that that France really has managed to establish a uh, a startup culture where it's okay to start a company and uh, and 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 if you if you have to stop that company, that's not failure. That's just learning. And if it if it succeeds, then of course it's also an economic su- success, and and that's really cool. Um, we also we also talked a little bit about the gender gap in uh, in tech. That is something that is super difficult to solve. It's a problem that that has been us with us for many years, and uh, we need to solve it. Uh, and we need to solve it relatively soon because I think yeah, obviously uh, women are just as talented as men and not having them in the in the industry is simply not only unfair i mean it's not uh, here we are on the data democracy it's not it's not very democratic but on top of that any any country would would lose competitive advantage not taking full usage of of, of all the talented women that could be contributing to to tech Sure. And then finally, uh, yeah, Catherine and Evo. Yeah, Evo also had some European perspectives on tech. It's a bit more of a pessimist than I am, but a very, very happy pessimist, I dare say. Uh, and um, and had had some great, great uh, examples of how uh, Europe should establish more tech hubs capable of delivering really new innovation with uh, with tech. Then finally, I had uh, Catherine Jamal. We had a long chat on everything privacy. She's just a wonderful person. And I think the key message I learned from her is that privacy is not something you turn off or on. Privacy unfolds itself on a spectrum from complete privacy, where you just shut everything down, erase all your data, to no privacy at all, where you exploit data to its maximum, 
uh, and thereby compromising all the sensitive data uh, requirements that you would have to respect. That was uh, that is her her take, and you cannot go into very deep detail about that or in terms of uh, mathematics and so on. But thank you, Luke, for the questions. I, I wanted to talk about the guests. I, I sense that I am talking a lot about my not myself, but I'm just I'm eager to also hear you, Luke. So let's turn the mic. First of all, Luke, obviously people that know you knows that you have had a quite an extraordinary track record in, in what you have done in your career. So uh, you are an entrepreneur in tech. Can you share with the listeners a little bit? What have you done in your career? How has it been? What do you currently think of uh, of Sunia and where you are in your work life? And and what do you what do you plan in the what are your plans in the future? Thanks for asking this. Uh, first of all, I was very lucky. I started with at Microsoft when we were with five hundred people, so I had a chance to meet Bill Gates personally, which which of course is a honor. And when you look look in the back mirror. Uh, meeting this type of guy is really, really inspiring. Then I worked at Oracle in the software industry. Then I started consulting businesses that have grown tremendously. And uh, but and then Zinia, uh, finally. Um, in fact, I was not successful uh, immediately. You, know, you you make a lot of mistakes, and you hit walls. And uh, I had I had three books that I read that really changed my life, and I want to share the titles with you. If you if you aim to start a company, even for your own culture, you should read um, From Good to Great from Jim Collins. This guy explains you why what are great companies, and in, it's very simple. Great companies are made of great people, and and the lesson number one from this book is is uh, you don't have to care about how much you pay people, but who you pay, and get mm. the best on board, uh, give them the keys of your company. Of course, you have the direction and the vision, but delegate responsibilities to those people. Even if they're very young, if they're excellent, they will know where to drive the bus. He calls the bus. He calls the bus mm. a company. Uh, so okay. that's very interesting from good to great. Second thing is Seven Habits from Stephen Covey. Uh, that's a must read book, of course. Anyone knows this book. It's about being proactive. Uh, it's about listening to understand before uh, listening to, to answer all types of very, very, very um, achievable, um, uh, I would say, advices. And, and that's a must read. And, and the third one, everybody knows it, is to start with why from Simon Sinek. Um, when you're a company, you, you have to start with the why. And, and Xenia, we have a why, which is enabling data democracies. Huh? Uh, and people people uh, wake up every morning to to achieve this this mission we have, uh, which is enabling data democracies. So apart from that, I would say uh, you have to stick on on rock solid principles, which is work hard, share equity, uh, uh, focus on quality and transparency, uh, no corporate bullshit. Uh, just just be straightforward. Uh, and share knowledge, learn from each other, because even if I'm 55, I, have, I, I learn every day from you, from all the guys and girls who work at Xenia. So this, this is my, uh, my stake in being an entrepreneur. Is, uh, it's, it's not a, a single victory. It's a, it's a common achievement. And never forget yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I can definitely uh, sense that working with you. And that is a very nice and giving experience. So, so I'm really, really um, excited uh, to have, to have joined uh, Sunia. Likewise, we are very happy to have you on board, Ole. As you uh, as you know, of course. Yes. Well, thank you, thank you. Luke. It's a pleasure. Okay. So, my second question, Luke, and this one, I'm I'm trying to be the investigative journalist here a little bit, but you get to decide how much you want to share, right? But. But Sunia has been releasing uh, new features at a very high pace in the second half of, uh, of 2023, uh, including a new smooth analytics dashboard, a very pragmatic uh, integration to teams to communicate with your employees. You know, you shouldn't have too many like mailboxes and messaging systems. So, so this teams integration really lets you communicate in a seamless way, right? And then we also have the field uh, field level data lineage, a feature that many many customers has uh, have uh, have have expressed that they would like to have. So so we've really been releasing at a, at a very very high pace. 
And so for 2024, I know something uh, really big is cooking. I just wanted to ask you, uh, Luke, see if I could get it out of you. <laughs> uh, what, to what extent you want to share the roadmap for 2024 uh, with the listeners of the podcast? Mm, yeah, uh, yeah. You, we need to keep it secret, of course. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, um, yeah, indeed, we have released, I, I think it's like more than 20 features this year, uh, yeah. which, which is a, a nice proof that we have reached... Uh, a very mature engineering uh, delivery process, as well as a, a very efficient product design uh, roadmap execution. And, and thanks to Guillaume and, and, and Aurélien, the VP of engineering, and all the people who work there. I'm really impressed about the pace uh, and the quality of, of the, the features we're releasing. Um, Without disclosing too much, it, it's quite simple to understand. Uh, we all know that the market is shifting to data mesh which means that uh, in terms of data catalog, at least, huh, um, we will delegate to domains the responsibility to build their own data catalogs because they know what this is all about. So if you're working on the manufacturing department, you know how to document your uh, data related to manufacturing. Same thing applies for finance and admin, et cetera. So the market is going to a federation of data catalogs. Simple to understand. And, and I think we have a... We have a very, very strong, unique selling point in that particular field is the knowledge graph, because the knowledge graph will enable each and every domain to design its own ontology. And, and again, the way you classify your data in one department is, of course, very different from the other one. So the federation of data catalog is, of course, something we will be releasing next year. Uh, mm. Second thing, when, when we talk about data mesh, we don't talk about data assets anymore and reports, but we talk about, we talk about data products, which is a completely different way of designing your meta model, because you will embed uh, in data a lot of other, other metadata, like examples of code, input, input. Put uh, an output port, um, uh, specific metadata, lifecycle, versioning, uh, et cetera. So this will be something, of course, we will be working on in, in 2024. And we will, and I don't want to disclose too much, we will <laughs> run a little bit away from the pure data cataloging market space yeah. to follow something that really is obvious. And we, we have received in the last 10 RFPs a very specific requirements that we will be covering uh, in Q1 and Q2 next year. I, I cannot say more about that. No, no but uh, I, of course, uh, know what it is you're referring to. And I can only echo that uh, these RFPs are materializing ideas that I have uh, been sure. seeing discussed in books, uh, tech books, uh, and the community at large. Uh, for the last couple of years, and I think our answer is uh, is very very promising. But of course, uh, I also also understand, Luke, that I that I can't get any more out of you, so so I shouldn't uh, I shouldn't try to do that. You'll know more, I, I would say, in Q1, maybe early Q1. So I would yeah. say in three to four weeks, we will be um, communicating a little bit around that, not yeah. before. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Exciting times, really. It is, it is. Uh, I think it's the combination of uh, something very intuitive, very easy to use, and something that has been highly demanded uh, in RFPs and also from our existing customers is something that I genuinely look forward to explaining and uh, using, quite simply. And, so, and you know, if I may add something, if I may mm -hmm. add something, uh, yeah. The way we build our product is very simple to understand. We collect feedbacks from customers. We don't think about what the best product could be. We just co-build the product with our customers and very demanding big corporates. And this is where we constantly have a product that sticks to reality. Mm. And this is why we have reached, uh, and I'm, I'm doing some promotion here, but this is where we have reached the fact that um, uh, we, we have at certain customers 6,000 users, 400 data stewards, 15 different technologies, fully automated, uh, thousands of business terms, 
hundreds of thousands of data sets. And why do, can we achieve that? It's really data cataloging or data governance at scale because we listen to our customers. They know where to go. They know what to build. And that's very important in product design to build your product with your customers. And we even will run workshops with our customers for future um, features with them. And that's exactly. very important. Yeah, it's super important. It's, it's one of the advantages of uh, having uh, our size. I mean, not being several thousand employees inside the company. We can, we can go into a deep dialogue with, the, with customers and, um, and really tailor the product so that it perfectly meets uh, uh, their needs, right? Um, and, 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 and general needs. I mean, the, the needs to express are the needs from other companies. And we don't fork in, uh, one version per customer. We, we have one single platform, which is multi-tenant, but we listen to our customers because they know more than us what needs to be done in our product because they, they're using it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, and I think that also that ties back to the way you are an entrepreneur, right? I mean, entrepreneurs can be different. Uh, I guess all entrepreneurs are a bit different, but this close, close dialogue with the customer, being able to reflect those demands in, uh, in our product is this particular way of being an entrepreneur. If you stay in your uh, ivory tower, you fail. You need to get in touch with your employees and with your customers constantly. You need mm -hmm. to be on the field. If you don't do that, you're isolated and you do mistakes. As simple yeah. as that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that uh, should be the closing remark, Luke. Thank you very much for having uh, the time to, uh, to be on, on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.